Is NHS dental care affordable? Could Ukraine run out of money to fight Putin? And is the government's childcare plan in trouble? This is Politics Live. On the panel today, Conservative MP Tobias Elwood, Labour MP Rebecca Long-Bailey, broadcaster and former Labour advisor Aisha Hazarika, and Conservative commentator Albi Amancona. Today, can the government solve the dental crisis? We will be delivering up to two and a half million more dental NHS appointments uh, over the coming years. The longer the Conservatives are in power, whether it's dentistry or GPs or operations, the longer patients will wait. Will Donald Trump's supporters block military aid for Ukraine? For those Republicans in Congress who think they can oppose funding for Ukraine and not be held accountable, history is watching. And as the government promises to extend its free childcare offer, why are some nurseries struggling? We'll ask one provider why money's so tight. All that and Prime Minister's questions live at noon. Welcome. Let's start with this headline in BBC News because there is a battle over the nation's teeth. Dentists to get a £20,000 incentive as part of plan to combat NHS shortfalls. Under the new uh, plan, dentists will be offered a bonus to set up practices in areas of England with the poorest access to NHS care. A BBC investigation in 2022 found 9 in 10, 90% 90 of NHS dental practices across the UK were not accepting new adult patients for treatment on the NHS. Perhaps that's why, as you can see here, hundreds of people uh, were filmed queuing around the block outside a dental practice in Bristol to try and secure a place. Quite extraordinary, really. But my question uh, to the politicians to start with, Tobias, is should you just come clean about the fact the idea of people, everyone, securing an NHS dentist is for the birds? No, I don't agree with that. I think it's something that any uh, government would like to make a commitment to say you should be able to uh, access a dentist. And those cues there are totally unacceptable. But in your uh, introduction, where you spelled out most of the cases, the big challenge has been from COVID because the uh, original uh, traditional construct, if you like, broke after that. People didn't return back to their dentistries. We don't have enough uh, dentists as well. There's also something wrong between the private sector and indeed the state sector. We pay for dentists yeah. to be... But it's uh, that contract that hasn't trained. worked, well, has can, it? If, if I can finish. Well, that's what's tucked in the announcements today yeah. is also to fix that, yeah. perhaps to oblige uh, dentists that, that are trained for by uh, the state to then uh, stay how, how long, to sorry to interrupt again, but how in long, the state sector how, before they move to the private How long have sector. you had to do that? Sorry? How long have you had to do that since this wrangling over the contract? Well, it's more to do with where the, because of COVID, because of that disrupted completely. We couldn't access dentists because of infections and things like that. And clearly the old model, as I was saying, is yeah. no longer right. working, which is why you've got these huge incentives to encourage dentists to stay on, to expand their work. Sure. But the critical question I make, and I stress, is why are we paying for dentists to be trained by the by the state well, to then go straight to the private sector? That needs to change. Right. Well, you've had a long time to change it. Um, I, and they complain, of course, that the contracts are unfair and they don't make enough money to do that NHS work. But the same problem will exist for a Labour government if it comes in. Should you just be more honest? You've got plans to have kids' teeth brushed in school and so on and so forth. Um, but in the end, the idea, when you just look at that one example of people getting an NHS dentist, it, it's just a myth. It's not a myth. It's been chronically underfunded for nearly 15 years. Oh, so you're going to put a lot more money into it? Exactly, and provide Are incentives you? to train new dentists, put out an urgent programme to provide immediate appointments, and then there's a longer-term plan to reform the dental contract because, as you say, it just isn't financially viable for many dentists to provide NHS services. But the fact is, at the moment, we've got huge parts of the country that are dental deserts. It's so bad and so unaffordable for people to access private dentistry that people are resorting to pulling out the teeth with pliers. Oh, That's we've seen... how acute this crisis is and how urgent it is to solve it. How's it come to this? I mean, is it going to be a big political issue at the election now? Teeth. 
Well, I think what, what it does do, it, it provides a, another really powerful optic about this narrative of broken Britain. Mm. That's what it does. It's like, a, it's another thing which adds to a, a, a list of, of things in terms of not being able to get an appointment to see your, your GP. Um, you know, there are problems all across the, the country. We can't get our infrastructure done. And now on a really, really basic level, I mean, the sight of those people queuing up at that dentist and zoning into like older people who brought little chairs with them to sit, like because the queues were so long, people having their dentures in that. You just thought this is like something out of Victorian Britain. What is going wrong? And the, the other thing is a lot of people will see this and think, oh, this is just a health issue. It's not. We've got both parties talking about the economy. You cannot have a growing economy without a healthy workforce. So health and wealth are intrinsically linked. If we don't sort out our public services, if we don't sort out health service, if we don't sort out people's health, we're talking about teeth. There's another story which is not just growing lists of mental health, particularly for young people. If we don't get this fixed, we are not going to grow our economy. Those images are extremely compelling, aren't they? Whichever side of the argument you are on, just watching those cues for something that most people would assume is basic and fundamental, having your teeth checked. It's shameful. I mean, it's unbelievable that in modern day Britain we're seeing queues outside of dentists. I know at my local dentist, whenever I go and sit in the waiting room, the phone is ringing, ringing, ringing with people looking to be registered with, a, with an NHS yeah. dentist and they say they are not accepting new NHS, um, NHS patients at all. And that's just not good enough. But I do just want to come back on this point about dental deserts because that seems to be where the focus is on today. But if nine in ten dental practices mm. aren't taking on new NHS dentists, is it really just dental deserts that need to be tackled here? That, that indicates to me there's a problem in 90% of the country. All right, we're so going... Just to add to that. Briefly. Absolutely right to say that there are places across Britain that are worse affected. This is why we're having mobile dental units uh, come in. Not a long-term solution, I agree, absolutely, mm. but it will help in the short term because, to affect those areas that are particularly badly hit. All right, let's have a look at this headline in The Guardian. You are talking about uh, the health and wealth of the uh, nation. Aisha Starmer unwavering over Labour Green Pledge, despite claims party dropping it. Labour leader says £28 billion, how many times have we heard that figure, green investment desperately needed after sources said last week Labour were planning to ditch the policy. Yes, this is what's become something of a saga. Exactly what is happening with Labour's £28 billion green prosperity plan? It is the pledge to spend borrowed money on green projects and, in the party's words, turned the UK into a growth superpower. Well, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, was clear in using that figure in an interview with Times Radio yesterday um, and saying it's very, very important, in contrast to other members of his top team who've been reluctant to use it. Let's have a listen. We're going to need investment. That's where the £28 billion comes in, that investment that's desperately needed for that. Um, mission. Doesn't that make the £28 billion you thought was a pledge and now a vague ambition make that totally unaffordable? And isn't it time you were honest about it? Well, I've always been really clear, Simon, that all of our policies are subject to our fiscal rules. Is it a pledge or is it not a pledge? Can you use the word pledge? The pledge is for public investment. The overall amount of spending is determined by our fiscal rules. Rebecca, as a Labour MP, what is the policy? For the 28 billion, well, it's to provide 28 billion during the course of the Parliament to invest that in green industry and green infrastructure. And if you're serious about growth, mm. you have to be serious about investment in infrastructure because that catalyzes private investment. It provides long term certainty for business. And so, what, so why are Rachel, but why are Rachel our, um, Reeves and Johnny Reynolds, shadow business and shadow chancellor, why couldn't they make it a pledge, repeat the pledge and say 28 billion? They've pounds? got to be very careful in what oh. they say. And when they're spending that 28 billion, during the course of a parliament, they will have to very carefully provide evidence to parliament and the Labour Party that those investment decisions are strategic and that they will provide an economic return for the country, either through future jobs, sure. regional um, investment or future tax returns to the exchequer. But it's made everyone think it's not happening. You can see well, why. Been, Just looking at Keir's those two very, examples. Keir's been very clear that yeah. it is happening and it's important that it does. Right. I mean, it was announced in 2021. Aisha, just to give us a little bit of history, as an additional £28 billion funded by borrowing. Then it became minus the money the government is already spending on green projects, around £10 billion, so therefore only around 
£18 billion of new money. Then, as we've just heard from Rebecca, ramping that up, to use the expression by Labour, to £28 billion by about 2027. Now... We're not sure if the 28 billion figure is in doubt, although it's been restated by Keir Starmer. Is this confusion helpful to Labour's election strategy? I don't think Labour's going to win or lose the election on this figure of £28 billion. Pounds. But the confusion I think around when you, it. I don't think Labour's going to lose the election because of a confusion on this, to be absolutely honest. And look, we're still a long way off of, with the election. We've just been talking about the state of broken Britain. But what I think it, I think what Labour strategists will admit is that they maybe regret pinning uh, a, a number on it so early when there were so much things, so many things moving. And of course, you know, since then, lots of things have changed including, you know, Liz Truss and the mini-budget. But I think what the Labour Party has got to do is just stay strong on this commitment. Interestingly, when I speak to business, and I do quite a lot of work with um, businesses, a lot of, of in, in terms of in green manufacturing, which is very much a growth business, and mm. people see that as a business of the future, they are not at all bothered about this kind of row about the number because they feel that this is a really good policy and they know that more money is going to come in because it's happening in America. Biden has done a huge thing with his Inflation Reduction Act. The EU is mimicking this at all. Uh, so if you want to see mm. you're going to have a growing economy and you want to invest in jobs in the future, you are going to have to invest a lot of money. Maybe it might be £26 billion in the end. The other thing as well, which a lot of people in terms of actually delivering this money... You have to work with business sure. to pay the money. So I think what Labour's got to do is not be scared of the Tory attack line. Ah. The Tory attack lines are saying this is going to be £28 billion pounds of terrible funding. Yeah. I think Labour shouldn't be scared of they that scared because of you it, just say they? Liz Truss. I mean, but is, stick, but isn't that the point? That's why stick if, to if the... they just stuck to their guns from the beginning and didn't look like yeah. they were wavering around, is it going to be £28 billion? Is it going to be £26 billion? Is it going to be £18 billion? Then fine, fair enough. Make your point, make your argument and say this is what we're doing because we believe in growth. But but they are scared of what the Tories are saying. And it, what it looks like, at least from the right wing of politics, is that the attack lines that the Tories are using against them are working. Rebecca? Well, I don't think the polls bear that out or the by-elections. On this particular yeah, but policy, I think to, I think, to be fair, I think, to be fair, the polls and the by-elections do not so bear that out. So why are they wavering out. over it, then? Because they're trying to make sure that where Labour has had a historical weakness, time ah. memorial, is on the well, economy. Largely, well, that's sorry, an honest, well, that because, might... because of, you know, from the Jeremy Corbyn years, ah. there was lots of attacks on Labour's handling of the economy. So you can see why Labour are being nervous. There's that great phrase, isn't there, which Roy Hattersley said, that Labour in opposition is like carrying a Ming vase over a highly polished floor. And I think that's the challenge they're doing. But I do have some sympathy with what you're saying. I think they should be stronger about this. It's a good policy. Well, let it's me... popular with business. Sure. It's popular on the doorstep. But it's it, popular it's the, it's with the, the damage unions. being done over confusion. What do you say to Aisha's point that it's post Jeremy Corbyn years, the pledges to spend and borrow so much more that the Ming Var well, strategy you know, over this has come into play? Take Aisha's comment about being nervous. I understand that the front bench are nervous about this, but this is a decision that is going to increase growth dramatically over the course of a parliament. We should be confident in our arguments. And I think what's happened, unfortunately, over the last few months is that there's been a lot of dialogue in the media and it's created an impression that there isn't confidence. When there actually is, when I speak to front bench colleagues about this, they've got very robust plans on the matter. And that's the message that we should be putting to our electorate. And even in you know the time when I was in the shadow cabinet, we had very robust plans. Mm. Well, and we yeah. tried our best and sometimes maybe failed on the messaging somewhat. I'll agree and I'll take that on board. But we proved very clearly Clearly, that the amount of money that we're investing was going to dramatically increase growth, was going to dramatically sure. increase jobs and investment. And you're right convinced, and UK. you're convinced, but it's not even in the let's get Britain's future back, this Labour pamphlet, not the specific uh, figure here. It's got Keir Starmer uh, there on the front, but it's not in there. Why not? Well, there's a lot of detail that isn't in there, and the. the the position in relation to each policy will be set out in far more detail prior to a general election. As, as we've well seen with the, with the dentist position, we outlined our policy on dentistry in uh, quite a lot of detail and the Tories stole it. So we have to be very careful in terms of what we set out in detail. Just, I mean, it's a good point. So, well, let, let yeah. I'll come back. Okay, I don't think we're going to be boring this idea of borrowing 28 billion. Why not? Because we tried that under Liz Truss and it didn't work. Okay, so this is the strategy and how you deal with our economy. I disagree, if I may. What's going to be important in the next election is who's going to manage this country through this continued difficult times with international headwinds affecting our economy. Well, what we're seeing here. Are you can, saying that the Conservatives uh, have? Let me make my point and then please uh, come back. But to borrow 28 billion, which we have not cost, 
which we have not, whatever you're going to do with it, mm. borrowing 28 billion that you have not got will see interest increase, interest rates increase. If interest rates go up, so does inflation. We've just come through a period whereby we're seeing deficit come down, we're seeing debt come down as well, interest rates starting to settle as well. Why would you then want to jeopardise that well, by borrowing and 28 this, and billion And is this what's making, pounds? these are the Tory attack lines that you call so them, just Aisha? Just point, because well, the others have a good. The reason well, I hang on, but this, is mainly, Tra- but this is mainly about Labour, and we will, I will come back I, to you, I, I but Rebecca, you want to respond. Trust, the reason why it's a comparison with Liz Truss is look how the market's punished, and look how fiscal okay. responsibility is so important, ah, something well, the Conservatives so pride ourselves on, just which is on why we moved on for that. And now Labour are very nervous about it. Tobias has made a really excellent point, and this is so, so important. I'm really glad you've raised this. Liz Truss totally spooked the markets because her unfunded tax cuts came out of nowhere and we literally watched the pound crash as, as she... And then not only that, Kwasi Kwarteng went on Laura Koonsberg and said there could be more cuts to come. The difference between that, and you're absolutely right to think about fiscal discipline, is that nobody could say that this policy is going to be sprung on anybody. This policy it's has been talked... Hang on, let me finish, got. let me finish, let me finish. This is something which has got huge buy-in from business because they know that this is the kind of investment that we see happening in America and that the markets in America haven't been spooked by this. In fact, America's economy yeah. is growing really, really well. Jobs are growing well. As Inflation is, is as not is as well it's as America. Than Germany's not right well. Now. That's because that's because Germany. This. So that, but your argument about spooking the markets doesn't bear witness well, on, on that, this. What about the, the, to have the tax cuts or not to out. have tax cuts? Isn't that the same row that is going on in the Conservative Party for the reasons you've just set out, because you do not want to do anything that spooks the markets or looks unaffordable. Absolutely. Where are you on the tax Absolutely cuts? Absolutely right. Well, you heard Jeremy Hunt in the November statement. What did he do? He came out with £20 billion of tax incentives mm-hmm. to get our industry and our business working, for them to invest in their capitalisation uh, and move their country. And just uh, recently he said there may not be as much scope for tax cuts. There may not be. And that's, right. that's, again, fiscal responsibility returning to the Conservative ranks. Right. Let's just have a look at this headline just before we move on. Cracks between Starmer and Reeves are starting to show over this particular issue because Rachel Reeves says no policy is outside our fiscal rules and no policy, including the Green Prosperity Plan, sits outside of those rules. That, in the end, is going to be more important than the investment in green policies. Well, I think that's rubbish, that there are cracks between Starmer and Reeves at the moment on this issue. And I think Rachel's right in terms of constantly outlining our fiscal rule, that you only spend on your day-to-day spending what you receive in tax, and that you make sure that when you do invest and you borrow to invest, that you have your debt fall in as a proportion of GDP over the course of a pilot. That is crucial. Right. It's important. And it's more but crucial. That is achievable with the £28 billion. Rachel's already done the calculations How do you do on that. Anything different with public services funding than the Conservatives, if that is the line that you are taking? People have big expectations of what a I Labour agree. government I might agree. bring. They expect a lot more on public spending than what they're getting now. But you've basically just said you're not going to spend any more than the Tories on anything. So what, why are people voting no, for the Labour No, we're not saying we're not going to spend any more. That's our fiscal rule, but we will look at efficiencies in the system. I think Rachel is very clear on that. And I think there's also, in my own personal view, I think there's a discussion to be had about the black hole that's in our public finances. Our local authorities and our public services are going to need an immediate mm. injection of cash to deal with 15 years of chronic underfunding and austerity. And I hope that their conversations that the party's having now, for example, looking at a wealth tax is one option that Rachel oh. could consider. Yeah, but she's not. She's not at the moment and hopefully... Oh, that's you think some, she might? Well, possibly. It's my mm. hope, but she might not, but who knows. But there's certainly a growing consensus around this and groups such as Patriotic Millionaires UK have been repeatedly campaigning on this issue. Right, well, we'll leave it there because uh, we're going to talk about the Russia-Ukraine war because tonight a US border border and a Ukraine aid bill is being debated. Um, It's a piece of legislation that pledges a further $60 billion in American military aid to Ukraine, amongst other things. Donald Trump has urged Republicans not to vote for it. Let's have a look at the reaction here in the Financial Times. Joe Biden, the US president, blames Donald Trump for sinking US deal to fund Ukraine war effort. Uh, Let's welcome Fred Flights from uh, Washington, D.C. He served as chief of staff on Donald Trump's National Security Council. Um, Hello to you. Why don't Trump supporters like this bill? Pleasure to be here. Well, there is a growing concern in the United States that there has to be a plan to end this war, a a route to a ceasefire, a route to peace talks. 
there's a growing belief that this is a war of attrition the Ukraine will lose. And there's no mention in this bill of peace talks or ceasefire. Instead, there's a call for a report on how we can provide a weaponry to Ukraine so we can win the war. I would like Ukraine to win the war, but I think we're past that moment. And until there's a realistic approach to this conflict, I, I don't think it's going to get Republican support. Right. I mean, Joe Biden, as you know, has had some pretty strong warnings and criticism for Republicans considering blocking the bill. Um, he says Republicans owe it to the American people to show some spine and do what they know to be right. History is watching. A failure to support Ukraine at this critical moment will never be forgotten. Uh, does that weigh heavily on your shoulders? I think the argument that... Uh, the appearance of Russia, Russia winning uh, will be a threat to democracy, could embolden America's adversaries is a valid point. But frankly, we are past that moment. That's something Joe Biden should have thought of a long time ago when Ukraine needed the weapons, which it could have used to win. We're now in a long time ceasefire that is killing a generation of Ukrainian men. Trump says, let's end the fighting. And this isn't just the view of Republicans. Richard Haas, the president of Council of Foreign Relations, no friend of Trump, he believes this. Henry Kissinger believes this. Let's stop the fighting. Let's freeze this conflict. Let's arm Ukraine to the teeth. Let's work on getting Ukraine its territory back through negotiations uh. rather than destroying the country first. All right, Fred, let's bring in our other guest, Tobias Elwood. How can you convince uh, Fred Flights to have a, a different viewpoint to help this bill go through? He says the moment's passed. I, I'm really concerned. I don't know if you speak for Donald Trump, but is that his position, that he would want a ceasefire, that he'd want to introduce talks, that he would allow Russia to redraw the map in Eastern Europe? Because if that happens, Russia will not stop there. You talk about giving uh, Ukraine the weapon systems they need. Why isn't Donald Trump then pledging to say we will give Ukraine the attackums and the other missiles that they require? That's what we need to see. Otherwise, as I say, this is going to be one part of the world that changes in a very fragmented, contested world where we're seeing other problems around. The threshold for the West to handle all these plates spinning is really being tested now. We need to sort this out in Ukraine. And right. it really worries me that Donald Trump will come in here and want to close the issue off, even uh, remove support, military funding and support for Europe as a whole. Fred? I think Trump will use his leadership to force Putin and Zelensky to come to the negotiating table. And this idea that Russia is going to invade other countries after Ukraine is frankly a myth. Russia has been uh -huh. the loser in you're, this war. You're willing Ukraine's to take a that loser, risk, too. There's no doubt of that. You're willing to take that but look, risk. Russia's military has been destroyed. Its reputation has been destroyed. And as I said, the moment when we could have given Ukraine the weapons to win, that moment you still has can. passed. You still can give, the, uh, give, yeah, give Ukraine sorry, the weapons Council to win. I'm sorry, Relations disagrees with you. Uh, so, so did Henry Kissinger. So did a growing number of people on the left of the United States who don't see the point of an endless war of attrition. It's time to end this war. Let's start negotiations. The reality is we may have to wait Putin out until we can get this territory back to Ukraine. All right. But let's not, That's not advocate a strategy. this nonsense that Ukraine is, that Russia is going to invade NATO after Ukraine. There's no evidence of that. Uh, all right. Um, uh, Albie. With respect to Fred, I don't think he is being entirely honest. This bill is also linked, of course, to the southern border crisis in the US. And the, there's been a bipartisan effort to try and get some more money to solve the problem at the southern border. Is this not really, Fred, about the fact that Donald Trump wants him, him to be elected later on this year with as much mess as possible coming from the Democrats so he can say, I'm the one that's going to clean it up. If this bill is seen as being successful at solving the issues on the southern border, if this bill is seen as being successful at solving the problems that we're seeing in Ukraine, there's less of a mess for Trump to clean up. Fred? I think it really was incumbent upon President Biden to have three separate votes on Israel, on Ukraine, uh, and on the southern border. But instead, he held Ukraine hostage to the southern border and made a deal on the southern border that most Republicans oppose. And I know there's allegations right now that this bill's going down because 
Trump and his supporters don't want to give Biden a win. All and, right. and look, maybe that's a valid argument, but and I don't think that's the case. And here. it is true that there were lots of things, and there are lots of things bound up in this bill, but I want to focus on what could happen as a result in terms of support for Ukraine. Last week, Tobias, the EU managed to get its Ukraine funding package approved, but it was a struggle. We're seeing Biden clearly facing those same struggles. Is there a trend here in terms of support in this financial way for Ukraine? That is the worry that we're seeing, an accumulation of a, uh, uh, an absence of, of, of commitment that we're seeing. It's starting to wane as it drags on because we're not giving Ukraine the facilities and the military equipment that they need to conclude this. And it really worries me. It's really scary to hear somebody close to Donald Trump who possi possibly could get elected, saying, I'm gonna, happy to talk about um, uh, a ceasefire, talks. That is appeasement. That's 1937 all over again. All right, we'll come back to Fred in just a moment. Rebecca, your thoughts on this? Because we have heard in the last couple of years since this war uh, started, it's fueling inflation, making things like energy much more expensive here. Do you agree that Fred might have a point with some Republicans that it's not sustainable? Well, the concerns I've got with the US vote is that it provides quite a lot of wider geopolitical instability. And the reason for this is that America, the US and the UK signed up in 1994 to a memorandum with Ukraine, and that was in return for Ukraine relinquishing its nuclear weapons arsenal on its exit from the Soviet Union. Now, interestingly, Russia was a party to that memorandum as well and haven't observed their obligations. But the question will be for the US to decide, are you a country that keeps your promises internationally or are you not a country that keeps your promises internationally? And that's where the, the instability lies. Right. I mean, it is about reputation and standing in the world, Fred. The idea, as, as some of the uh, guests have suggested, if there's less enthusiasm for America's commitment to NATO too and Article 5, um, that is going to lead to more instability. Well, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, so Article 5 doesn't apply here. No, and I think if it were to invade last... another country that is a member of NATO. I, there's no... Well, Putin is not going to risk a nuclear war by invading a NATO member, and I think people who assert that are making things up. But I think the points by your last guest are valid. We did make commitments to Ukraine. We didn't abide by them. As I said, that moment has passed. We can wish we hadn't done that, but we're in a situation now where Russia is deeply dug in, it is bringing up more reserves. Ukraine is running out of soldiers. And the, the responsible thing, the thing that I think is most responsible for the country is to end the war, get Ukrainian refugees to come back to the country, rebuild the country, arm the country to the teeth, and begin a long-term process to get Ukrainian territory back by peace. You're, you're, the, the fellow who All spoke right. to, to you a moment ago, yeah. brilliant guy, if he believes that, why don't we send in British and American troops? That's how we could kick Russia out. Ukraine, no one wants to do that. May, Ukraine that is not asking for troops. Let's they have with plenty. Peace. All right. Ukraine has plenty of, of boots on the ground themselves, their own people. They've got the courage to step forward. What they're missing is the military equipment that we should be providing them. Right. I mean, it is interesting, though, when you say, yes, they're not asking for troops on the ground, but the outgoing chief of the general staff, Aisha General Sir Patrick Sanders, has warned that the UK needs to grow its military by around 45,000 in the next three years and equip a citizen army. I mean, is this the sort of thing that we need to be looking well, at? Let's not kid ourselves. We are in no fit state right now. Even if we did want to put boots on the ground, that's not going to happen. But I think what's really interesting about your um, guest's argument, and I do agree with Tobias on this, it's just fascinating to hear somebody representing Donald Trump, who has had lots of criticism for having too close a relationship with President Putin, essentially saying, let's just appease Putin. Let's just go slow. Let's go in his timeline. I'm sure he will do the right thing and give Ukraine its land back. That is for the birds. Also, interestingly, if these guys are now putting forward an argument for an immediate ceasefire and getting around the table and talking, I presume they're going to say the same thing about the situation in Israel and Gaza right now. I think it's interesting because we're getting this view from across the pond, which is saying, well, what's the end point of this conflict? Well, hmm. And it doesn't really seem to be a discussion that we're having at all on this panel or that we really have enough in Europe. It's just we must give Ukraine as much military aid as possible hmm. so they can beat Putin without actually thinking, well, what is the end game here? Which is why I think it's interesting to hear from Fred over in the US to actually talk about what an end game might look like. Yes, we might not like it. But shouldn't we be thinking about what the end game looks like and how we get there rather than just condemning Ukraine and Russia 
to this endless war. But I think the prop I think the difficulty is to get any sort of talks, you're gonna to have to get Zelensky. In terms of all the people I speak to from Ukraine, I speak to Ukrainians regularly on my show. They have not done anything wrong. They have just gone about their lives and Russia has invaded them to try and take their land and to, and to take over their kind of society as well. So I think that would be fine if you could say, look, both sides had done some wrong. Come on, guys, let's meet in the middle. Let's hammer out a deal. For the Ukrainians, they understandably do not think they have done it because they haven't. This is pure Russian aggression on Ukraine. That makes a sort of that makes peace talks very, very, very difficult. Exactly. We've entered a new era of insecurity. This but is what is the end game? Element of it. And that's what, why General Saunders spoke as he, did, as he did. We need to brace ourselves and prepare ourselves mm. for a new decade of instability. Our world is fragmented, becoming ever more contested. Indeed, it's splintering into two spheres of competing influence. But You've got China, if I can finish, China, Russia and indeed Iran, the Global South sitting out and then the West. And the West is too risk averse to stand up to this latest round of aggression. This new period of instability is only going to grow. And if we allow Russia to f move forward into Eastern Europe, it won't stop there. There's a lot of a lot of Europe that's not in NATO. That's where Russia will go to next. But what does the West look like and European security with less US support? Because I guess this is the nub of the question, isn't it? If Donald Trump gets in, is he going to pull out of NATO? If Donald Trump gets in, is he going to put less military aid into Ukraine? What does that look like, European security, and, with less US support? Right, well, let, let me just, well, well, let me just ask... The FCO and, indeed, other parties... All right, well, let's get now. a final thought. Is that what could happen, Fred, if, first of all, Donald Trump wins the Republican nomination, which looks highly likely, and were to win the presidential election? Pulling out of NATO, no longer Europe can rely on the US for support. You know, I read The Economist and London Guardian. I see uh, all this uh, extreme worry about... Trump coming to office. I'll remind you that during four successive presidencies, Putin invaded neighboring states during three of them, but not the Trump administration, because Trump was a decisive leader who Putin thought was unpredictable. This isn't going to be appeasement. This is bringing back a credible and strong president to promote global security. Uh, that's what we need right now. That's why I think Trump has a chance of ending this war. It's going to be distasteful. I don't like seeing Russia holding on to any Ukrainian territory. But as I said, the right. moment has passed where we can roll this back by throwing more weapons in. We have right. to stop the killing but with Trump rebuild did promise, Ukraine. Did, did threaten Finally. to pull out of NATO. That's not going to help European security. We're going to That's finish it there. Happen. No, that's, that's not, not going to happen. Oh, well, we heard it here first. Uh, Fred Flights, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Good We're going to talk about something completely different, which is childcare and childcare policies. We've talked uh, a lot about this already um, this week on the programme. Um, and that's because you will remember that in the spring budget last year, parents of two-year-olds were promised 15 hours free childcare a week from April. And then in September this year, eligible children from nine months will get 15 hours of childcare per week during term time. But we now hear that this key policy pledge may not be met on time. Let's listen to the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan. What you can't do, Trevor, which I think you probably know, is guaranteeing something in the future that you're not in control of all the bits. Right. You're not in control of all the bits, as she put it, so succinctly, and that sounds like she can't guarantee that the pledge will actually come into operation in April. Let's talk to Jerry Garvey, the owner of Muddy Boots Nursery in Penrith, Cumbria. Welcome to you. Uh, can you deliver on the government's policy as it stands? Firstly, good morning. Um, no, in response to your question, the answer is no. I think the government are relying on, obviously, all the nursery providers to actually be on side and provide that service. Um, many of them, like myself at the moment, are not able to. One, because we're full already and there's no space. Secondly, those nurseries who may be able to provide have not got enough staff to re reach their potential. And thirdly, the money they're offering does not meet the need of the nurseries. Right. Well, to us, it sounds like there's a massive problem on the government's hand with this rather cornerstone key policy pledge. And there's an awful lot of us, um, backbenchers, that are lobbying the, uh, the Chancellor at this very moment ah. to, to see whether we can actually fix this. And hopefully we will get an announcement in the March statement. 
it's so important that we honour this pledge, that we allow uh, childcare to continue to grow in advance. So we're well, from nine months to the age of uh, to you know school, st school starting age, that uh, parents are able to uh, uh, put their children in 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 some form of a nursery. Right. That is our commitment. It was supposed to start in 2025. I think this full package of measures has been graduated. I will be lobbying very hard to make sure that we are still committed. What uh, Gillian Keegan was talking about there was the numbers of stakeholders that are involved. And you just heard uh, some comments there of some of the challenges that we face, the actual locations themselves, the, the number of, 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 of nursing support and so forth. That all needs to be addressed. But ultimately, it comes down to money. And that's why the Chancellor, I hope, will make something, uh, some positive announcements on this uh, in March. Right. I mean, Jerry, you're reassured by that. I mean, Tobias Elwood seems to be crossing his fingers for a policy that he very much believes in to hear what the Chancellor has to say next month. Well, it sounds OK on paper, but firstly, what he's got to remember is for the policy to work, you've got to have the staff. There's been a chronic underfunding in the childcare sector for many years now. And as a result, a lot of those who have worked in the sector have actually left and not gone on to other employment because it pays more. You know, unfortunately, the policies that are put in place. Um, every year the funding's available, but what doesn't happen is it meets, goes up um, the interest rates, meets the current interest rates when we have increases in national living, wages, mm. taxes and everything else. So there's a, a big divide between the two and nursery just cannot afford to operate under that. Right. I mean, Rebecca, you also, or the Labour Party, very much wants to have a transformative childcare policy. But again, I mean, look at what's happened here. Um, do you take notes that it's not that easy if you haven't got the staff and the places? Well, you actually have to have a, a detailed plan. And I think this is where the government's problems lie, where they made a promise and broke that promise because they hadn't filled out the detail. There was a skills crisis when the Chancellor made that announcement. Childcare organisations warned him at the time that the promise was unsustainable without huge investment in the skills in that particular sector. Nurseries themselves, as Jerry has just said, can't afford to provide the extra childcare because their margins are so low. They're struggling as it is and nurseries are closing up and down the country so because what they're would, not finding what, it financially sustainable. So what could Labour do in the envelope that exists at the moment? Well, what Bridget's agreed to do is to have a childcare review to look at it with the sector comprehensively and she's also been exploring plans to uh, look at the role of primary schools and nurseries within primary schools to see if they can be used as a vehicle to roll out uh, rapid childcare. Right, I mean, there's obviously a gap here, Jerry, between ambition and desire on the politician side and what can practically be delivered. Are you turning parents away at the moment? Um, yes, we are. I've actually got no places up until September 2025 in certain rooms. Um, oh, that's because the demand is so high and the availability of places is so low. Alby? Huge problem. I think it's absolutely right, and I'm so pleased Jerry brought up the fact that it's also a people problem, a workforce problem. I was having a conversation earlier on with someone from the Fawcett Society who said exactly the same thing. There just aren't enough people going into these childcare roles. So it's all well and good to say the government's going to spend £7 billion on nursery places by 2025. But if people aren't going to, in, into nursery teaching, no one is going to be able to send, send their children to nursery. And I think there's also something else that we can do. Not everything Liz Truss did was bad when she, when she was in government. She did also start the conversation about childcare ratios in the, in the United Kingdom compared to in uh, European countries where childcare ratios are lower. So there is a regulatory reform aspect to this as well, which could deliver cheaper childcare. I'll just get a note from... What did you, did you make of the, the extending of ratios, uh, Jerry, when Liz Truss suggested it? Would that be something you'd support? Absolutely not. Right. Um, for the reason, for those <laughs> of us that work, for those that work, us work with children, especially this is um, uh, inherent to the two-year-olds. You know, the the ratio originally was one to four, and it's been increased to one to five. You know, you've got um, four or five two-year-old children who need a lot of care and attention. Some are still sp are not speaking yet, haven't got language. Some are still in nappies and that. For one practitioner, that's a lot to take on. If you have a busy nursery class, it can be quite mm -hmm. stressful some days. The end result is if we do one to five over long term, mm. we burn our staff out and we have more emotional well-being problems and that adds to our recruiting woes. Um, well, I'm actually on the board of the Fawcett Society, so this is something that we have been looking into um, a, a great deal. Um, it's really important for children's development to have good, high quality childcare. It's also so important for not just mums, but dads, families as well, in terms of trying to get people back to work. And I think... 
if you care about families and if you care about trying to support people back into work, you have got to properly support this service. It's sort of, again, there's a theme through this programme, whether it's dentistry, whether it's NHS waiting lists, whether it's mental health services, whether it's our care sector. You've got a crisis in all these services. And does it all need You've money? Got, is it well, money yeah, that will transfer? I'm afraid it does need money. It needs a number of things. Money is very, very important. You cannot do childcare on the cheap. It is not fair to expect nursery providers and nursery staff in the same way it's not fair to expect carers who are paid barely minimum wage to pick up the slack for the fact that this stuff is not properly invested. What you also need, to Albie's point, um, and this applies to carers and other things as well, if you are making, and it is often women working in these low-paid sectors, where they are paid peanuts, they are expected to pick up the emotional slack of families where it's caring for older people, caring for our babies and our toddlers. If we care about the, it's this connective tissue mm. of society, we as a society and as a state and come together, wherever your politics are, and say, we've got to fund this properly. No disagreement here from the politicians. It sounds like you're committed to that. Um, Jerry. What if there was one thing that the politicians could do to help you deliver the policy as it stands, what would it be? I think more engagement with the actual sector itself. We, I've heard, heard a couple of times in here, let's engage in, with this and that. I go to lots of meetings and speak to lots of nursery providers, be up in Cumbria, I go nationally with the likes of National Day Nurseries Association. and. The, the sense of the matter I get sometimes is there's just not enough engagement or lip service is paid to what they're saying. Ah. These people are the professionals. They need to be listened to. You know, they're not there to con anybody out of their money. They want it to work. At the end of the day, it's people's children. And we should remember that. Thank you very much, Jerry. You wanted to say something. Just, just reflecting on that. One of the things that the, the late, great Tessa Jowell, Dame Tessa Jowell did was when she was in opposition with a lot of other really good Labour women MPs, including Harriet Harman and others, they knew childcare was a huge issue and they really, really... And that was a big thing of more women coming into Parliament as well in 1997. And the Sure Start Centres, which was very much a project pioneered by the brilliant, brilliant Tessa Jal, had a really big impact. And I think it would be really good for political parties not to use things like this as a political football, because that was actually quite a good structure. Children's care is too important for it just to be weaponised and politicised. Well, it may be discussed at Prime Minister's questions. Let's go into the chamber because MPs are filing in uh, for questions beforehand. We've got a few minutes to go. And, of course, Rishi Sunak may be mulling over the launch of another group uh, or family within uh, the Conservative uh, fraternity and sorority. It was called Popular Conservatism, led uh, by his predecessor, uh, Liz Truss. What do you make of the group? Populism is dangerous. It it builds on fears, it uses sound bites to try and win across support, and it's very short-termism. We've just spoken about the rise of authoritarianism across the world. We're seeing an erosion in democracies as well, and I don't want to see it in Britain, and I certainly don't want to see it in the Conservative Party. We're months away from a general election, so to learn that yet another group is being formed that's not rallying and supporting the Prime Minister, frankly, I, I really don't understand it. It stems, I'm afraid, from our system, the fact that we choose a leader and it's our membership that makes that decision. And all this, the noise that's being made, whether it be whatever group it is, is all about appeasing our base, not looking beyond our base. Our successful prime ministers are the ones that take our base forward but uh, appeal to the country as a whole. Right. That's what we should be doing and that's what Richie Sunak is doing. Right. I mean, I wouldn't be careful by insulting the Tory base. It's the Tory base that goes out every weekend all. campaigning out of the goodness of that heart are for free for MPs like you to stay in Parliament. So just be careful about what you say about the base. The base, actually, at the last leadership election, wanted Kemi, Kemi Badenoch and Penny Mordaunt in the final two. The MPs gave us Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. So you'll have a part in what's happened with the Conservative Party since 2022. What I would say about populism, though, is that I totally agree with you. I think Liz Truss's popcorn is a complete farce. But we've got to think about why populism happens. Mm. It's because ruling parties don't do what they say on the tin. The Conservatives haven't cut migration, we haven't cut taxes, we haven't been good enough on defence, um, and that is when populism thrives. Right. I mean, expectation management is very important, isn't it, for political parties? Is that why Keir Starmer is as careful and as cautious in so many of the areas in politics as he is at the moment, according to some on your wing of the party? 
I think so, but then the real test will come when we're in government, um, mm. when those expectations from our constituents will be rightly high, because they will expect a Labour government to make their lives better. And that's what we need to do in the first 100 days of government in outlining bold radical policies. We've already got some, the New Deal for Working People's fantastic. Some of the green policies that we've outlined, fantastic. But we're going to have to go a lot further to win and retain that trust of our voter base to show that the Labour Party really does change lives. Aisha? Well, I think what the Conservative Party is about to go through is what happened in the, the Labour Party, where the, a populist base sort of dominates the, the, the party. And I think you are about to enter your sort of blue momentum phase. Uh, and that will mean um, a lot of infighting. I mean, there's already been Not a lot of infighting. Not if some of us can help it. Um, and it will be a gift to the, to the Labour Party. But why party? has Rishi Sunak not been able to convince Jacob Rees-Mogg, Liz Truss and all those other people that were at that popcorn, as they call it? If I'm honest, I think they've potentially written off our prospects at the next election, mm. and that makes it harder. Have but you? I stress, and I just underline, the importance of our base. But our membership also recognise that MPs, the parliamentarians, need to make that final decision. So all right. Include the membership, but allow the MPs Let's the final Let's listen choice. to Rishi Sunak. Speaker, I know the thoughts of the House and the country are with the King and his family. We wish His Majesty a speedy recovery and look forward to him resuming his public-facing duties in due course. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I also send my best wishes to the King. Last week, the Foreign Secretary said that we, with allies, will look at the issue of recognising a Palestinian state so that the Palestinian people can see irreversible progress yeah. towards yeah. a two-state solution. Yeah. But afterwards, it was briefed that these words had not been signed off by Number 10. Ah. Does the Prime Minister agree with his Foreign Secretary? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister, Speaker, our long-standing position has been that we will recognise a uh, Palestinian state at a time that is most conducive to the peace process. But the most important thing is we are committed to that two-state solution and working with our allies to bring it about. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, people in Northampton South are desperately short of NHS dental provision. Indeed, in Duston there is now none at all. So today's dentistry recovery plan announcements are hugely welcome. Uh, but can the Prime Minister guarantee my residents improvements within months and not years? Yeah. Well, right, Mr Speaker, we are publishing the Dentistry Recovery Plan today and my honourable friend, the Health Secretary, will be making a statement shortly. Over a million more people saw an NHS dentist last year than the year before, but we know that there is more to do and that's why the Recovery Plan will make sure that NHS dental care is faster, simpler and fairer for patients and staff. Yeah. Did the opposition kiss them? Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join with the Prime Minister in sending His Majesty the King our very best wishes for his treatment across this House. We all look forward to seeing him back to full health as quickly as possible. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother, Esther, has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. Mr Speaker, a year ago, the Prime Minister promised to bring NHS waiting lists down. Isn't he glad he didn't bet a grand on it? <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr Speaker. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, at least I stand by my commitments. Yeah. It, it, he, he, he's, so, he's so indecisive, the only bet he'd make is an each-way bet. Yeah. Oh, Mr Speaker, he says he's, he stands by his commitments. He once insisted, insisted, that if he missed his promises... These are the words he used, I'm the Prime Minister, and then he said, it's on me personally. Today we learn from his own officials that he's the blocker to any deal to end the doctor's strikes. Yep. And he's always, every time he's asked, he blames everyone else. So what exactly did he mean when he said it's on him personally if he doesn't meet his promise? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Yeah. Mr Speaker, well, we are bringing the waiting list down for the longest waiters. We're making progress. But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I 
think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. The, the list goes on, but the theme is the same, Mr Speaker. It's empty words, broken promises and absolutely no plan. Of all, of, all the work, of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame, parading as a man of integrity when he's got absolutely no responsibility. Absolute. Of all... But either side. I, I think the member's getting carried away. Can I just say that our constituents want to hear the questions and they certainly want to hear the answers. They don't want to hear organised barracking. So please, I want no more. Keir Starmer. I think the role of the Prime Minister is to ensure that every single citizen in this country feels safe and respected. It's a shame the Prime Minister doesn't share that. I welcome the fact that he's finally admitted that he's failed on waiting lists in the NHS. I also welcome that he's finally acknowledged the crisis in NHS dentistry. He's calling it a recovery plan after 14 years of Tory government. What exactly does he think the NHS dentistry is recovering from? Prime Minister. As, as, as ever, Mr Speaker, he, he seems to convene... Certainly not having enough the front bench either. Please, I want to hear it. The election fever, I'm hoping, is not coming tomorrow, so let's not behave as the witness, Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as ever, he conveniently forgets the impact of a pandemic on NHS dentistry, and it was specifically because of the close proximity nature of dental provision that it was unable to operate as normal throughout the pandemic. That was the recommendation of the medical and clinical experts, Mr Speaker, which is why inevitably there is a backlog in dental care and the impact that it has. But that's why, as the Honourable, my Honourable Friend, the Health Secretary, will outline later today for the House, we're putting more funding in to provide more NHS provision across the country, on top of plans that will see the number of dental training places has increased by 40%, Mr Speaker. But I would actually just point out, our plans mean that there will be two and a half million more NHS appointments, which is in fact three times more than the Labour Party are proposing. Mr Speaker, there are some areas in the country where you literally can't have an NHS dentist. And he says that's down to COVID. People are literally pulling out their own teeth. Sorry. Can I just say... I don't need any more off this front bench either. Do we understand each other? Carry on, please stop. Speaker, people are literally pulling their teeth out using pliers. It's an experience that can be compared with extracting an answer from the Prime Minister at this dispatch box. The truth is, after 14 years of neglect, this recovery plan is just a desperate attempt to try to recover back to square one. If he wanted to move forward, he should follow Labour, scrap the non-DOM tax status, use the money to fund two million more hospital appointments every year. But, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is oddly reluctant to follow us on this. What exactly is so special about this tax avoidance scheme that the Prime Minister prioritises it above the NHS? Well, Mr Speaker, let's look at that record. We've, in the NHS, record funding, record doctors and nurses, record number of appointments, m higher cancer survival rates. But what's happening under Labour's watch in Wales, Mr Speaker? Let's have a look. A fifth, a fifth of people in Wales are currently on a waiting list. Waits of 18 months or more are ten times higher than that in England, and people are waiting twice as long for an operation. Their failure has sent the Welsh NHS back to square one, and we'll never let them do that here. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when he admitted that he'd failed on waiting lists, I actually thought that we might be entering a new era of integrity, professionalism and accountability. <laughs> Remember that one? But just like all the other relaunches, it's proved to be a false dawn, still blaming everyone else, still removed from reality. It's very simple. You can either back more NHS appointments 
or more tax avoidance. We know what side we're on. Why doesn't he? Well, Mr Speaker, the best way to ensure that we continue to fund the NHS, as we have, is not to make £28 billion of unfunded spending commitments. But ju- and just this morning, independent Treasury officials have published a formal costing of just one part of their eco-promise, their insulation scheme, and it turns out that it will cost double what they had previously claimed. Not the £6 billion that Labour accounted for, but £13 billion every single year. It's now crystal clear they have absolutely no plan, but we all know how they're going to fund that gap. More taxes on hard-working people. Mr Speaker, this is Mr 25 tax rises. He, he's literally the country's expert on putting taxes up, and he thinks he can lecture everyone else on the economy. Last week, he and his MPs were laughing at someone whose mortgage had gone up £1,000 a month. This week, he's casually made a £1,000 bet in the middle of an interview. Last week, he thought even raising questions about the cost of living was, and I quote, resorting to the politics of envy. And this week, he's finally found the cause that he wants to rally around, the non-dom status. When he finds himself backing tax avoidance over NHS appointments, does he start to understand why his own MPs are saying he simply does not get what Britain needs? Mr Speaker, I'm not going to take any lectures about getting, about, about getting Britain from a man who thought it was right to defend terrorists, Mr Speaker. But what we're doing is building a brighter future for our country. In just the last week, expanding health care in pharmacies. Today, expanding dental care. This week, helping millions with the cost of living. And most importantly, cutting national insurance. All while the, all while the Labour Party argue over 28 billion different ways to raise people's taxes. That's the difference between us. We're delivering a plan. They can't even agree on one. My constituents and I send our best wishes to the King and Royal Family. Mr Speaker, despite the popular narrative, our economy is doing well with an unemployment rate with an with an unemployment rate well below the EU average, strong inward investment and record employment. Taxes are higher than Conservatives would like, but does my right honourable friend agree that a key reason for this is that we rightly spent £400 on Covid support, including one of the most generous furlough schemes, in order to ensure that no one got left behind and that it is our intention and instinct to lower taxes, unlike the party's opposite. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight our record of providing support to the country when it needed it, whether it's the NHS, vaccines or furlough during Covid, or most recently help with people's energy bills. We're only able to afford that because of the strong management of our economy, which is why we must stick with the plan, not risk going back to square one with the Labour Party, who, as we know, have absolutely no plan and will cost everyone in this country with their £28 billion worth of tax rises. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I begin by expressing my heartfelt sympathies to Brianna's mother, who is in the public gallery as we speak, and also to send my best wishes to King Charles in what will hopefully be a quick and full recovery. Mr Speaker, the public are used to the Tories gambling on the lives of others. Boris Johnson, he did it with public health during the pandemic. His immediate successor, she did it with household finances. So not to be outdone, the Prime Minister on Monday this week accepted a crude bet regarding the lives of asylum seekers. In doing so, he demeaned them as individuals and he degraded the office that he currently holds. So can I ask him, will he apologise? Mr Speaker, we may have a principal disagreement on this. I believe and we believe that if someone comes to this country illegally, they shouldn't be able to stay, they should be removed, and that's why we're committed to our Rwanda scheme. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, as ever, the Prime Minister does himself no favours because, of course, the bet to which we are referring was worth 
£1,000. And it came just hours before the Prime Minister ended cost of living support worth just £900. And his justification for doing so was that the cost of living crisis is easing. So can I ask him, what does he believe leaves him looking most out of touch with the public? Gambling £1,000 or believing that the cost of living crisis is getting better? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, he talks about the cost of living. Perhaps he can explain to the Scottish people why it is that whilst the UK Conservative Government is cutting their taxes, the Scottish Government is raising them. Yeah. So, Mr. Mr Speaker, the thoughts of the people of East Worthing and Shoreham are with His Majesty as well. The Archbishop of Canterbury has admitted that since taking office, the attendance at the Church of England has dropped by 15%. And in the 10 years to Covid, the number of baptisms in the Church of England has fallen from 140,000 a year to 87,000. So Christianity in the UK seems to be on the wane, unless apparently you are from a Muslim country in the middle of an asylum claim, and we are now told that one in seven occupants of the BB Stockholm have suddenly become practising Christians. Can I ask the Prime Minister, given that the Church of England has now issued secret guidance for clergy supporting asylum applications for these Damascene conversions, who is the Church accountable to, and are taxpayers being scammed by the Archbishop? Well, Mr Speaker, when it comes to illegal migrants, we need to have a system whereby if someone comes here illegally, they shouldn't be able to stay. I can tell him that my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked for more information about the extent to which migrants converting to Christianity is playing a role in our asylum system. And more generally, under our Illegal Migration Act, anyone entering the UK illegally will not be granted asylum here. That's why we need to have somewhere to send them and why our Rwanda scheme is so important. The Labour Party have blocked these measures every single step of the way because they don't have a plan and they won't keep Britain safe. So Geoffrey Donalds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I, on behalf of my party, extend our best wishes to His Majesty the King uh, for a full recovery? Mr Speaker, I want to thank the Prime Minister for his dedication and leadership in helping us to restore our place in the United Kingdom and its internal market and to revive our political institutions at Stormont. The Union is more secure as a result of our combined endeavours and together we have greatly enhanced the potential to build a strong and prosperous economy that will help to cement our peace in Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, securing peace in an unstable world is vital for all of us. And therefore, will the Prime Minister examine the findings of a recent report by Policy Exchange that calls for Northern Ireland to play an even greater role in the defence of our nation? Prime Minister. Can I start by thanking and paying tribute to my honourable friend for his own leadership over the past few months? He and I agree that the union is stronger for the return of devolution and the work that we've done. I'd be delighted to examine the findings of the report, and I've seen with my own visits the vital role that Northern Ireland is playing through the location of firms like Tallers and Harland and Wolf. Uh, but as he will know, I'm delighted in last week's command paper, we specifically committed to examining how we can further bolster Northern Ireland's share of the UK defence sector, because it's another essential pillar, pillar of our precious economic union. Virginia Crosby. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister know where the best site for large-scale new nuclear in the UK is? And will he commit to buying the Wilbur site, now the only gigawatt site in Wales this year, and make sure it's progressed as soon as possible to meet our net zero and energy security needs and give the enormous boost to the Honest Morn and North Wales economy? As ever, my honourable friend is a fantastic champion for Wilfa and the nuclear industry. I can confirm to her that Wilfa is a candidate for the new nuclear site and one of a number of potential sites that could host civil nuclear projects. No decisions have been taken at present, but Great British Nuclear is working with the government to support access. And we're also developing a new national policy statement providing the planning framework for new nuclear power and would very much welcome her and other contributions to that consultation. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last year the Prime Minister and other senior ministers were given the conclusions of a government audit of research programmes 
at UK universities with links to the Chinese state. The audit flagged up hundreds of programmes of being at high risk of being used potentially by the CCP for military use and other applications in strategic and sensitive areas that are of high interest to an authoritarian regime such as China. A smaller proportion were judged to be at extremely high risk. Despite that, the government has elected to do nothing about it. So will the Prime Minister confirm his personal knowledge of that report and explain to the House why no action is to be taken, these programmes have to be continued unimpeded? Mr Speaker, we will continue to take a robust and proactive approach towards our relationship with China, rooted in the UK's national interests and values. And in fact, our National Security Act, which we passed last year, brings together vital new measures to protect our national security, and that includes creating a foreign influence registration scheme through the Act, which has been created to tackle specifically covert influence in the UK, and will continue to take all possible powers to keep the country safe. Two remarkably talented and enthusiastic individuals from Kettering, Becky Horrell and Lindsay Atkins, have put together a really ambitious £2 million bid to repurpose the redundant gala bingo hall site in Kettering High Street into a community arts, music, business and family hub, which would be simply transformative for Kettering Town Centre. Would my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, please be kind enough to facilitate a meeting for us with the relevant culture and levelling up ministers so we can explore how a combined community ownership fund and cultural development fund bid might get us across the line. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for highlighting this exciting initiative and also commend Becky and Lindsay for their campaigning. He'll know that our £150 million Community Ownership Fund is there specifically to help safeguard small but much loved local assets, and indeed our Cultural Development Fund, like the one he mentions, is there to support further cultural projects as well. I will ensure that he gets a meeting with the relevant Minister to discuss these plans further and wish him and his constituents all the best with this redevelopment project. Janet Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Data revealed by the Centre for Cities showed that over after 14 years of Tory rule, towns and cities in every corner of our country have been levelled down, left behind and left out of pocket. On average, people are over £10,000 a year worse off because his party has failed on growth. When will the Prime Minister take responsibility for breaking Britain? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, in fact, what we're seeing is record investment in our towns across the UK, many of which were neglected by the Labour Party for decades, Mr Speaker. But if we really care about levelling up, what we need to do is avoid saddling hard-working Britons with higher taxes, which is exactly what Labour's £28 billion green spending spree would do. Mr Speaker, for 27 years, constituents across the Vale of Glamorgan and across the whole of Wales sadly have to wait longer to see a doctor, longer for an ambulance, longer at A&E, and longer for an operation than patients in England. There are 24,000 785 <laughs> patients in Wales waiting longer than two years for an operation. Okay. That okay. number in England is 227. Does my right hon. Friend agree that Anirin Bevan will be turning in his grave yeah. on the fact that you can't trust Labour with the NHS? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my right hon. Friend is absolutely right. Whereas here in England we have a plan when it comes to education, where we're marching up the league tables and we have virtually eliminated those waiting the longest amount of time. But in Labour on Wales, as he said, education rates are falling and waiting lists over 18 months are more than 10 times higher than here in England. It's crystal clear we should stick to our plan for a brighter future and not go back to square one with Labour. Sam Tony. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to Open Democracy this week, since 1999, at least 391 people have died at our borders. That is a rate, Prime Minister, of more than one man, one woman, per month for 25 years. And on top of this, the financial cost is deadly and failed border regime, as well as the Prime Minister's plan for Rwanda, is estimated to cost at least £800 million since 2014. So will the Prime Minister now show 
that he understands that the people whose lives he's making sick bets on are human beings and provide them with safe routes to the UK in order to seek asylum instead of more failed and extreme forms of deterrence. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, it's in fact criminal gangs that are exploiting vulnerable people and leading many of them to lose their lives as they make these dangerous crossings. Now, on this side of the House, we think that's wrong and we want to do something about it, which is why we need to get a deterrent up and running and be able to send people to Rwanda. It's his party that opposes that, so the question for them is why do they remain on the side of the criminal people smugglers? Thank you, Mr Speaker. February marks Emotional Health, Boost Your Self-Esteem and Children's Mental Health Month. In recent years, something like 6,500 people die in the UK each year due to suicide. And in 2021, I was nearly one of them. <laughs> Luckily, my attempt failed. I was found by family members quickly. I received amazing care at St Helia and Springfield hospitals, didn't do any permanent damage, and was well looked after by the NHS in the months that followed. And I want to take this chance to say thank you to everyone who saved me, and sorry to my family and loved ones who I put through such an awful ordeal. In that moment, I felt alone and scared and like there was no way out and that the world would be better off without me in it. But I don't recognise that man anymore. I know that nothing is ever really worth that. Help really is out there and I'm pretty awesome. (laughs) Does the Prime Minister agree that one death by suicide is one too many? And will he send a message from the dispatch box today that whatever you're going through, you are not alone, that help is out there, and better days lie ahead. Well, Mr Speaker, I know the whole House will join me in commending my honourable friend for his bravery in sharing his story. And I can absolutely assure him that we take this issue incredibly seriously. The new suicide prevention strategy ensures that we will have the actions in place to reduce suicide over the next years because we absolutely recognise the impact that it has on people, their families, and we should do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Ms Dress. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I take the opportunity to ask the Prime Minister if he will consider apologising to Brianna Gray's mother for his insensitive comments. But turning to my question, The independent report into Teesworks, released last Monday, throws up more questions than it answers. And it's vital that we now have a National Audit Office investigation. The report was scathing and said there is insufficient transparency to offer evidence of value for money. Shouldn't the government lead by example? And will the Prime Minister finally release details of his conversations surrounding Teesworks, as he was asked to do twice last year. Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I, th- I think the Honourable Lady was talking about the report in Teesworks, as far as I could see, but, and what that report noted was that the pace and scope of the regeneration had had a wide-reaching positive impact on the local economy, and of course it was an independent external report. It makes it clear that there is no evidence of corruption or illegality, and the government will, of course, respond to the recommendations in the report as soon as possible. Alicia Cairns. Speaker, can I give my heartfelt thanks to the Prime Minister for his support for our Melton Harbour and Stamford villages following the recent devastating flooding. But tens of homes, farms and businesses in Rutland were also devastated. But our county is in effect excluded from ever receiving support in the future due to the arbitrary flaw that is currently put in place. Flood support should be based on the most affected or a percentage of population. But Rutland has to have one thousandth more flooding than next door Lincolnshire for us us ever access support. So will my right honourable friend please give a meeting to me and the member for Swindon South to discuss this important issue? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, of course, I extend my sympathy to all those impacted by the recent storms and flooding. We are investing record sums in flood defence across England, and the recovery support framework is in place for families and businesses in every area that have experienced exceptional flooding. I know that my honourable friend is in touch with DLUC ministers about how those schemes affect her constituency, but I'll ensure that she gets the correspondence and meetings that she needs to deliver for her local communities. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, I challenged the Prime Minister on his government's broken promise on building new hospitals by 2030, including in my own area. But now it seems that the government are downgrading existing hospitals too. 
Children and parents in Eastbourne will be forced to travel for miles if the proposed downgrade of the hospital's paediatric services goes ahead. Campaigners have asked the government to call in this disastrous plan. Will the Prime Minister agree? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, actually, we are investing record sums in improving hospital infrastructure across the country. In Eastbourne in particular, spades are already in the ground to deliver an elective surgical hub, Mr Speaker. And I know that there is local Liberal Democrat scaremongering about the future of services, but the local Conservative MP is doing a fantastic job engaging with our community and working with local health officials. Jenstein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday it was my huge pleasure to host the Aerospace, Defence and Security Industry Apprenticeships event in Parliament, welcoming two apprentices from Collins Aerospace in Wolverhampton. Would he join me in National Apprenticeships Week um, for celebrating the opportunities apprenticeships can provide in the defence industry and also in our armed forces, who are all in our top ten apprenticeship providers? Yeah. 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 My model uh, friend is absolutely right to highlight the importance of our apprenticeship provision, which is providing young people with opportunities across the country, but particularly, as she says, in the defence and aerospace sector. And those plans are in stark contrast to those of the party opposite, who have caved into big business and are now proposing to halve the amount of apprenticeship funding and halve the number of apprenticeships. Kenny McCaskill. If Greensmouth Refinery closes, Scotland will be the only major oil-producing nation without a refinery capacity. At a time of energy insecurity, is it not economic madness to allow a profitable plant to close, and is it not environmental madness to transship oil for di- refining and distribution across the growingly dangerous high seas? Given the billions that he has received from North Sea Oil and the billions that he will continue to receive from North Sea Oil, will he ensure that Scotland retains a refinery capacity for Scotland's oil? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the future of Grangemouth Refinery is obviously a commercial decision for their owners, but I'm told that the site will remain operating as a refinery until at least May of 2025. And in the meantime, the UK and Scottish governments are working together to seek assurances from Grangemouth about how they are supporting employees. But we remain confident in our fuel supply. And in terms of energy security, which you mentioned, that's why this government is unambiguously backing the North Sea oil and gas sector, because that's how you support energy security in this country, attract investment and create jobs, particularly in Scotland. Dame Carolina. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was very proud that it was a Conservative government that appointed the Patient Safety Commissioner and proud that we commissioned the Hughes report into medical devices and medicines, which was published this morning. Will my right honourable friend also make me proud that we can address the points she has raised and bring forward a redress scheme in a timely manner? Prime Minister. I'm grateful to the Patient Safety Commissioner and her team for their work on this important issue, one which I know my honourable friend has spoken about in the past. Of course, our sympathies, first and foremost, remain with those affected by sodium valparate. We're focused on improving the system and how the system (coughs) listens to patients, and it's right that the government carefully considers the the report's recommendations. The Department for Health will be responding to the report in due uh, due course, and the Health Secretary will keep the House updated on a regular basis. Sarah Edwards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my Tamworth constituents, like local mom Jessica, have contacted me about special educational needs and disability support. Jessica's son has waited years for an autism diagnosis and doesn't expect to have an education, health and care plan in place by the time that he goes to secondary school. Will the Prime Minister confirm that students that need an EHCP will get them so that they can thrive in school? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, of course we want to see every child thrive at school, which is why we've tripled the amount going into special educational needs for capital places and put more money in to support EHCP plans. I'm sorry to hear about the case she mentions. I'll make sure that we continue to look at that in particular, because, as she said, we want every child to thrive at school. Charlotte Shilbrook. Wishes to His Majesty the King and Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales. 
Um, I know my writing will friend, and building on the answer to my writing will friend, um, is exceptionally pleased with um, the huge report that's come out today. And there's been a huge amount of work that's taken across this chamber from the Honourable Lady for Livingston, the Honourable Lady for Washington, and my writing will friend for Southampton and Romsey. Um, may I push the point, though, to my writing will friend, the Prime Minister, that tens of thousands of women and children have suffered immensely since the 1970s, and government after government has not done anything about this. I'm proud that this government has done something about it. So can I urge my right friend the Prime Minister in the strongest possible terms to talk to our right hand friend the Chancellors to make sure that at the budget we can really address the issues raised in the huge report. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, can I thank my honourable friend and colleagues on all sides of the House for their campaigning over many years on this issue. As I said, it's, it's right that we not only do we extend our sympathies to those affected, that we carefully consider the recommendations from the Commissioner's report. And I can assure him we will do that with all due haste. And I know that the Health Secretary will keep the House updated. Final question, Vicky Foxtrot. Uh, thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Why did the Prime Minister downgrade the role of Minister for Disabled People? What message does he think this yeah. sends to them? Yeah, yeah. And will he commit to reconsider this move and ensure the role is a Minister of State? And if not, will he agree to meet with me and disabled people's organisations and explain his reasoning? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, actually, the Minister... For disabled people is going to do a fantastic job because she passionately cares about this issue and this government has a record to be proud of whether it's supporting many more of those with disabilities into work ensuring they can live independently or making sure that children with complex disabilities have access to more changing places across the country because those mr speaker are the values of this conservative government and mr speaker, i could just say also to brianna gray's mum who is here as i've said earlier this week what happened was an unspeakable and shocking tragedy, Mr Speaker. And as I said earlier this week, in the face of that, for her mother to demonstrate the compassion and empathy that she did last weekend, I thought demonstrated the very best of humanity in the face of seeing the very worst of humanity, and she deserves all our admiration and praise for that. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Well, that brings us uh, to the end of this week's Prime Minister's questions. Let me introduce our guests for this part of Politics Live. First of all, for the government, Laura Trott, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Bridget Phillipson uh, for Labour, the Shadow Education Secretary, and Vicky Young, the BBC's Deputy Political Editor. Let's pick up on that. It was quite striking at the end of Prime Minister's questions. Clearly, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, feeling that he had to say something in response to a question being raised by a Labour MP of his insensitive, um, as she put it, his insensitive comments on trans rights, which was in between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, obviously trading barbs, if you like, when the mother of the murdered trans teenager, Brianna Jai, was watching in the gallery at PMQs. Just shows how sensitive these issues are. Yeah, and there will be some saying that Rishi Sunak should you know, never make references like that. It doesn't matter whether someone's sitting there or not. But on the other hand, the idea, of course, that the grieving mother uh, has, was sitting in the press gallery, uh, Esther Jai. She is here, incidentally, because she is attending a Westminster Hall debate about mindfulness in schools organised by her local MP. Uh, as you say, that was picked up on because previously uh, Rishi Sunak has mocked Sir Keir Starmer, uh, about um, self-declaration for trans people, for example, mm. for, as he would put it, not knowing what a woman is. You know, it's something he said many times before, but of course, on today of all days, incredibly unfortunate. He obviously, as you say at the end there, didn't quite apologise, no. um, but did make a reference back to it. And I think it just shows when political knockabout re you know, meets real, real, the real world, actually, is what that shows, I think. Laura Trott, should he apologise? No, I saw the brilliant interview that Laura Koonsberg did this weekend mm. uh, with Brianne's mother and you know what happened was obviously completely horrific. What Brianne's mum was talking about there was the specifically around social media and around mindfulness, um, both of which I think we need to look at in, in light of this. Uh, I don't think we should make this a huge issue about trans. That's not what she said this weekend, that that was what it was mainly about. And I think it... I think we need to be very sensitive and listen to what Brianne's mum had to say. No, absolutely. But the fact that she was there and in the knockabout, as Vicky said, things can be said that feel and seem very inappropriate at the time. So much so that the Prime Minister felt he did have to reference it um, at the end of PMQs. Uh, but he's been asked to apologise for those comments uh, in the light of today. Should he? 
I think he was clear about what Keir's comments were about this in the past. You know, they're, they're public comments. Um, I, I think, as I said, I don't want to make this all about trans because that's not what Brianne's mum wants to talk about with this, right? She wants to talk about social media and whether we should be looking at more of a on social media. That's a very, you know, important issue that we should be talking about. Mindfulness in schools, you know, she's yeah. got this Western tour. I think that's what, that's what we should be focusing on. Right, you're not going to say that, that Rishi Sunak um, should apologise. Are you going to continue to demand that uh, he apologises for those comments today? Well, I think what we saw demonstrates what happens when discussion around certain issues becomes divorced from people's lives and experiences. And what has frustrated me with so much of this wider discussion, whether it's about um, the role for schools or what we see around trans people, is that we do need to treat one another with some basic respect, basic decency and compassion. And especially where it comes to children and young people, it should be about their well-being what they need in terms of support. And sadly, I have to say, far too often in recent months with the Conservative Party, it's become a means of getting a cheap headline, pitching for the leadership. No, that's not right. It has. That's not right. It really no, no, has. And up. these are people's lives. No. This is children's no. well being. That should be our it focus. Is right that, yes, it is children's well-being. And it's right that we talk about the impact that some of the practices we've had has had on children's well-being. And I think Kemi has done that incredibly effectively. We have to be able to talk about these things. We must do it in a sensible way, but we must be able to talk She's about these things. She's made it all about her no, she and has all not. about the leadership contest true. to come in the Conservative Party. You're just trying to belittle. This is too... We should, no, it's we because with I the believe issues. it's important. No, no, I believe should be the issues. Well, yes, then, then we should be talking well-being. about it. Yes, she hasn't. She's made it about no, headline hasn't. grabbing in no, the Daily no. Telegraph. That's but not, what not about that children? Is what would not you true. be advising as Education Secretary if you win the next election? What, what sort of guidance would you be issuing? I believe I agree that schools need guidance. That's what I've heard across the country from school leaders. Do they, or do they need to be mandated on issues around things like trans rights in schools and how it should be sorted? They want clear guidance because they want to avoid there being variation or dispute arising because of that lack of clarity. So I agree with the government that we do need to see so guidance. Do you agree with Kemi? No, you, no, no what I don't. Do you disagree policy wise? Do you disagree with Kemi? No, I don't. But the fundamental disagreement that I have is that this is too important to make but it then about. You're you don't can I, if I could please finish, say. Laura. I believe it is too important to make it about personal ambition. I agree. If I could just finish. We do need guidance on this, but we need to do it in a way that is respectful and takes account of what is a very complex and sensitive issue. It is right, therefore, that what the government have published is a consultation document that many organisations in school, right. including school leaders and children's charities, will be responding to. It is you're important making it about that we, person. Exactly. No, what you're, saying. you're talking. You're not talking about the issue. You're talking about the issue. Right. The equalities. Uh, she is, and it is a joint document between Kemi Badenoch. Mm and All the right. education department, which has been the subject of extensive dispute between those two departments precisely because of her personal ambition. That is outrageous. She's dealing with the issues that are facing the government. And if you can't say that you disagree with any of the policies that you're putting forward, then you're just making ad hominem personal attack. I disagree with the attack. inflammatory language that is used on an area of children's well-being. But you don't disagree with the policy? I agree with the need for guidance. We are All looking right. carefully at the yeah. exact measures many organisations are looking in detail at its practical application. And it's a very this clear is, message This from is Labour. complex. All right. Very and clear. if anyone uh, would like to see that very moving interview uh, Brianna Jai's mother Esther uh, gave on Sunday uh, on the Laura Kunzberg show you can of course find it on the BBC iPlayer. The other parts of the questions from Keir Starmer were very much about painting Rishi Sunak as a man who is out of touch. Uh, a man who is out of touch particularly following on from that bet that he made in terms of flights going off to Rwanda. He made it, it was a thousand pound bet uh, with Piers Morgan on his show. And it then went on about non-DOMS tax avoidance and so on and so forth. Stephen Flynn, uh, the leader of the SNP at Westminster, picked up on a similar theme. Is it beginning to gain traction? Um, it's difficult to know how important people feel the wealth of the prime minister and his family is when it comes to their decisions on who to vote for. Yeah, I mean, I think this isn't the first time this has come up. No. I mean, of course, you can talk about degrees of wealth and Rishi Sunak is right up there. You know, he's not just rich, he's phenomenally wealthy, as is his wife. But, you know, similar things were said about David Cameron uh, at the time when he was opposition leader trying to get into power, that you know, you're out of touch if you yourself as a leader don't experience the hardships uh, that people have. Now, I think there are ways of, of deflecting that and, and of answering that. But I think the problem is, for Rishi Sunak, when you do think, 
things like accept a £1,000 bet that feeds into those attacks uh, from the opposition. So it's tricky. And of course, cost of living crisis as well being the backdrop well, uh, to all of this. Well, let's pick up on that headline, uh, Laura. The Prime Minister, BBC News, Rishi Sunak claims cost of living pressures starting to ease. What's made him say that? Well, inflation is going down. And I mean, that's, that's it. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that is, you know, what's driving the cost prices of are still prices. prices are still rising, yeah. but they're rising at well, a bit of a rate. The yeah. target yeah. is the 2%. It's not zero inflation, it's 2%. So, yes, uh, we accept that there is a general level of inflation. That is for, you know, improvements in quality, that type of thing. But right. But the prices, uh, are, prices are... But the cost of living crisis, he does admit, it's implicit, it is continuing. He thinks I mean, it's easing course, and you can do better, but it's continuing. When will it be over? Well, no, I think that, well, I mean, the general forecasts are um, that uh, the market expects the inflation to turn to... 2% by the end of the year, right? That is a huge achievement considering it was 11%, you know, a year ago. And that hasn't happened by accident. That's because of the work that the government has been doing wow. with the bank. And because of that, we're able to start making, helping people with cost of living by cutting taxes like we did with the national insurance. Right. But according to a report, which you'll know about, the National Institute for Economic and Social Research this week, the living standards of the poorest half of households will be as much as 20% lower this year compared with 2019, 2020, and wouldn't return to pre-pandemic levels until 2027. Do you accept that? I think that we know that people's living standards have been squeezed and that's because of high inflation and that leading through to high interest rates from the Bank of England, right? We, we know that that has had a huge amount of pressure on people. Uh, but that's why we put the support that we have that is in place. That's why the Prime Minister has been so focused on bringing down inflation. Uh, and that is, and we're showing now that the economy is turning a corner um, and we don't want to go back to square one with Labour. Right. Taxes have been cut. Yes. National insurance. Yeah. There's a debate live and kicking about whether Jeremy Hunt will go further. Yes. But in terms of the costs and whether they are affordable or not, how big do we think these tax cuts might be? Well, look, you wouldn't expect me, Joe, to comment on the budget uh, on Shame. your programme. I would get into quite a lot of problems uh, if I did that. But uh, what I would say is that we'll only do things when it's fiscally responsible to do so. You're right that the autumn statement was the biggest tax-cutting event um, since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And we think that's really important because yeah. it has been really tough for the last couple of years. It has, and, and we want to help. But it continues to yeah, be, doesn't no, it? Because it, the overall tax burden is still rising because of the freeze on those tax thresholds. That More is an overall people figure, go, yes. Yeah, it is. The yeah. overall figure, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it's pretty staggering. That's the record high figure. It climbs from around 36% to 37% over the course yes, of this but, Joe, why are those taxes uh, so high? Because we spent 400, 400 billion pounds during COVID, 100 billion pounds on well. energy prices, and also that's not been even in terms of the way we distributed it. We've asked, you know, people with the broadest shoulders to bear most of the burden. Right. And, uh, Bridget, you will support tax cuts, won't you? Because you've also complained endlessly about the highest tax burden that has been brought in by successive Conservative governments. So you would back tax cuts in well, the budget. Well, we didn't back the government when they put up national insurance and they've put up taxes on working people over 20 yeah. times. So you'll so you're support so the tax cuts? I, I, would, I would like to see working people being asked to contribute less and I want to see our economy growing. I'm not In the same way that Laura isn't going to speculate on what her Chancellor might or might not do, we would want to look at precisely what is put forward. But we can, we can trade facts and figures in terms of the state of the economy, the level of inflation. But what are people actually feeling at the moment? Do people feel better off? Do they go to the shops and think, sure. I can spend my money? Yeah. Food price inflation in particular is so high. Yeah. There is such enormous pressure on families. And, and I think when they hear Rishi Sunak seeking congratulation yeah. or praise for the brilliant job he's done, I think they'll think, what planet is this bloke They might on? also want to know what you are actually going to do. If you are supporting tax cuts, listening to you, it sounds like you do support tax cuts, why aren't you advocating instead, as many in your party would like to see, that any extra money goes into public services? Well, we do want a fairer tax system. That's why we've set out many of the changes around taxation that we would make. So, for example, ending the non-DOM tax state is putting that money into more so urgent, tax rises. urgent appointments in the NHS. Well, a more fair tax system but they that are makes tax sure rises. that those who can contribute do so. VAT on private schools, ending the private equity loophole, using that money to fund well, our public services. There are choices yes. that governments and politicians can make. And they the do. choices that we well, would let make me put, would be focused on well, those questions Well, let me put a different choice to you, because we had Rebecca Long-Bailey um, here sitting in that seat before uh, Prime Minister's questions, and she thinks you should do this. Let's have a listen. I hope that their conversations that the party's having now, for example, looking at a wealth tax is one option that Rachel oh. could consider. Yeah, but she's not. She's not at the moment, and hopefully... Oh, you think she might? Well, possibly. It's my mm. hope, but she might not, but who knows. 
Well, is she considering it? Rachel Reeves, sorry, not she. Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, considering, would she consider a wealth tax? Uh, no, we're not actively looking at that. I respect uh, Rebecca's right to express well, her wrong. views, but I don't, I don't agree. Right. Just to be clear, I mean, there are £28 billion of unfunded spending spree, which you are Let's committed be clear to. That's well, hang on, rubbish. Let's, well, well, oh, I mean, well, we'll come I mean, to that in a minute. Your leader not... literally said yesterday that it was £28 billion is desperately needed. Do you disagree with him? Are you team Rachel Reeves or are you team Starmer? Rich, uh, Laura, this is just honestly... But, it's but just that's, beneath I mean, you. This level of debate is just but, but no, but 20, you. He said £28 Sorry, billion pounds was desperately can, needed. We can, he literally look, said yesterday. I know yesterday. you've come in here with your kind of well, bits Bridget, to read out no, from I mean, the Tory attack team. Sorry, I'm just we repeating have a what your leader said yesterday. If you want to have a reasonable conversation about this, I'm happy to do so. Well, let, this, is about, this is about investing in the long-term prosperity mm. of our country, about the jobs and growth and opportunities. Is it going to happen? That's the question. It's not just about the rights and the wrongs. It's is it actually going to happen? Our Green Prosperity Plan is central to how we will drive growth, how we will create okay. jobs in every corner of our country and how we as a nation can lead the world. A country has to be at the forefront of this, the new jobs, the new technologies. I'm ambitious for what Britain can achieve. It's just such a shame that over the last well, 14 years we've had a government that has presided over falling living standards, stagnant wages and a, an abysmal record on growth. And I will take no lectures from well, a party that crashed the economy really and are serious. forcing millions of people to pay more every month on their mortgage because of a cavalier approach they took this under really Liz Truss. No the lectures you, you on fiscal responsibility a from the well, economic Laura... policy. A basic question about whether you're going to spend £28 billion or not. And then we have it the costings which okay, are today. I will answer that directly. Please. Will, yes. We will spend up to £28 billion ramped up over the course of the Parliament into the second term consistent with our fiscal All right. Well, that, well, that does that, sound I like a restating of the pledge. Answer. But it um, has been quite confusing over the last few weeks because quite a lot of your colleagues have refused to even use that figure. It sort of all went quiet for a bit. You can see how voters might be a bit confused about how wedded you are to that. Oh, was so it the answer, just to be clear? So £28 billion pounds consistent with fiscal rules, which is main saying that you're not borrowing. Oh. So that means taxes. Right. Is it going no, to it be? Means it it will in, no, it does not. It means it, it will... It means it will increase over the course of the Parliament, yeah. consistent with our fiscal rules. And the nonsense document, the shoddy piece of work that has been published today, which, and I things. quote, cost the policy, where officials were told to cost the policy without reference to what Labour have said they might spend in any given year, Let shows me... just how shoddy the... and second-rate the work that is being produced on behalf of all right. All Let me just Because we, we need, to explain, that that we need to explain this to viewers. It came yeah. up at Prime Minister's questions. It is a reference to a document from Treasury officials that seemed to throw doubt over the cost of one part of it particularly, which is the cost of an insulation scheme, um, which which is predicted to be £6 billion. This document apparently says it could be twice that. What is the well, truth the, of it? The, 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 the point about this is, firstly, about these kind of documents. Okay, So these have happened since the 1950s. It's not unusual for Treasury officials to be asked to cost opposition policies. Um, now, the timing of the release of it is what's caused controversy in the past. In 2019, the then Cabinet Secretary weighed in and said you cannot publish this the night before the election campaign kicks off. So what's happened this time, of course, is that the Conservatives have decided to, I presume, like drip this throughout the year. So this is the warm home plan. This is the upgrading of homes to improve their energy efficiency. Now, the document is here and it's suggesting that maybe Labour have got their figures wrong. But at the end, you've got additional notes and caveats. And it says here that they're assuming that this is an uncapped promise that it's fully exchequer funded and an undifferentiated model. But anyway, the point is that Labour have made very clear in their policy document mm. that it is £6 billion that will be spent. And uh, you have said yet again it will be within the fiscal rules. The question is, are the fiscal rules in the end more important than the, the, uh, the, fiscal, than the borrowing yes, to Yes, the fiscal invest? rules will be the driving priority. All right. And to be, and, and to be clear, the... Um, this document does not reflect Labour policy. They've costed it, it someone's does. policy, but they no, haven't costed I mean, ours. They have to cost All right, I'm exactly gonna, what you've said. I'm going to leave it there because we're going to look at another area of policy uh, because you're here as the Shadow Education Secretary, schools policy, because Labour are proposing to end the VAT exemption offered to private schools if they win the next election, which could see parents paying more from private school fees. Exactly why are you doing it, Bridget? Uh, because I want to prioritise investing in our state schools and we would use the money raised to create more mental health provision within our secondary schools, guaranteed mental health counsellor in every secondary school, and more teachers, 
Um, I believe our state schools need extra money. I think this is a straightforward question of fairness. Well, let's talk to Lavina Tandon, who has two children in private school. Lavina, welcome to you. Tell us about your situation and what this change in policy of Labour win the election would mean for you. It's not only me, Joe. There are 95,000 people and counting who have signed this petition who will be affected by this policy and many more who haven't. So people send their school ch children to private school for different reasons. It could be spe special needs. Uh, it could be uh, because they want uh, a kind of it appeals to their culture and heritage, which is the case in, in my case or they need more challenge, they need more attention. And not all of these people are actually rich, which is what is thought. This policy is going to damage, actually it's quite counterproductive, and it's going to damage the very people that Ms. Philipson is like trying to actually help, because these are people, and a lot of them are helped by the school. They are on bursary, they are receiving help from friends, family and organizations. And, of course, parents who are sacrificing and living a frugal life, working a lot, which all of us do for our children. Right. And, of course, all of us want great education, but it is only going to price these parents out and it is going to be okay. a, a wider class divide and will be for the super rich exactly what I don't think they want to achieve. So this right. is well, you not and other achieving parents anywhere. Say, yeah, you're going to be priced out. But do you think it's fair that private school education, to some extent, is subsidised by the taxpayer? Yes, because they are also helping. They are helping other people. All right. Uh, and, uh, yes, they are helping through bursaries. There are various other things that they are doing together to help the system. It's not one against the other. It's not putting one wow. school against the other, Joe. It is about education for all, all and right. having choice Levi of education Well, let me for put all. those. And let me put important. those to the Shadow Education Secretary. I mean, Lavina is saying that she and others could be priced out. Um, it'll be the preserve of the super rich. And it is pitting people and families and taking away their choice. Is that what you're doing? No, I believe in parents having the right to choose where they educate their children, including in the private sector. That we're, that, we're that not taking change. away that choice from Levine. No, no, uh, absolutely. Parents can decide where they want their children to be educated. I just believe that uh, we should end the tax breaks that private schools enjoy to prioritise investment in our state schools, where ninety-seven percent of children, uh, sorry, ninety-three percent of children, excuse me, uh, will attend school. That has to be our priority. And I've looked very carefully at the work of. Uh, the Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies, for example, about how much money we could raise through this policy. They estimate to be £1.3 to £1.5 billion pounds net. That's a considerable sum of money we could invest uh, in our state schools. I would also add that private schools have put up their fees year on year, way beyond inflation. I think they could be looking to make some cost savings to avoid parents uh, having that kind of experience as is being described. But let's be clear, the average private school fee uh, in England is over £16,500 per year. That is way beyond the reach of most parents. Most of your viewers, I imagine, their children will be going to school in state schools. They want a government that prioritises investment there. This uh, policy is popular, according to Ipsos Mori, one set of polls. Uh, I think it's about 57%. They think it's fairer. Yeah, I mean, look, this is one of those ones where, as ever, Labour just don't really have a plan. They haven't thought this through. Obviously, as you're raising the price of something, uh, that is going to have a demand impact. So it's going to put way more pressure on state schools as a result of more people leaving the private uh, sector to go into the state sector. They've not accounted for that. Secondly, they okay. spent the money um, uh, seven times, I believe. Is the, I mean, I've got here, you know, newly mm. qualified teachers, Breakfast clubs, breakfast clubs more teachers. That's, not, that's incorrect, I'm afraid. Um, breakfast clubs is, breakfast clubs is paid for by the non-DOM tax status. Extracurricular activities, okay. £8,500 mental health workers, post-pandemic catch-up. I mean, they spent this money a lot of times. So maybe not for that individual you're one. You're well, let me, documents evidently well, well, let me, let me just go back to Levine. The let me just go back to Levine. Uh, you want to comment on what you've heard? Yes. So, first of all, I... Uh, IFS themselves have said that these are uncertain figures and this is not uh, uncertain evidence. This is uncertain evidence and one wouldn't want to base everything on this kind of evidence. That's number one. And number two, uh, taking the point from putting pressure, of course, in school. And in, addi in addition to that, uh, some of these schools, if they are also the argument is given, if they would absorb this, mm. then they will shut down. They have said that they will yes. shut down. So you will have additional pressure 
of these private schools, some of them shutting down, putting more pressure on grammar schools. They have been coming forward and saying that's right. very difficult to handle. Levine. And number three, yes. this can be funded. I'm sorry, I do want to say briefly. this very, 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 very briefly. I, I, this can be, we want state, good state schools and why can't they be funded from other things and, uh, you know, the oil companies or the All right. uh, bonus well, let me just cap, put the, caps put, and bonus and whatever yeah. else. Well, Lavina, I'm, I'm so sorry schools. to cut you off because we've sort of run out of time and I just want to get Bridget's response. There is a serious point. If private schools close, where are all those pupils going to go? So the IFS consider that and don't uh, don't accept that there will be significant movement. Alongside that, we have a falling birth rate. We're actually in a position at the moment where schools are currently closing. Uh, right. So I, I don't accept the premise of that, but the IFS did take account of precisely that point and still are clear it will raise a lot of money. That's all we have time for. Bye-bye.